not ex an extensive question, but on the profile page, we have the project section, at least mm -hmm. on the main page. Yeah. How detailed should we be in our description of the tasks on that section? Or should we move the more detailed explanations in the projects page? So I would say that the front page, if you uh, do a, a review of the whole thing, it should be um, easy to skim, which means that it should probably be one paragraph on the front page, and then the detailed project description can go on to the details page. And so the idea is if somebody skims, um, skims your front page, they get a sense of all the different things that you've done. So you've done some deep learning, you've done some NLP, you've done some um, sentiment analysis, you've done some A-B testing, you've done uh, data pipelining. And then if they want to click through and learn more, they can click through on those aspects that are relevant to them. So my suggestion would be one paragraph plus um, a, a nice visual, um, which is relevant. And so I think in one of the presentations that we saw on Tuesday, there was a, for the group there, there was a system graph that uh, one of the teams had put together. And so that would be one example of a visual that highlights the key aspect, because the key aspect there was putting everything together. So I would say one paragraph on the front page with a good visual, and then on the details page, um, you can go into as much detail as you would like. But I, I don't think you need to go into a crazy amount of detail. I think uh, the point the point actually on the front page uh, for the paragraph is you want to be able to, all of this goes back to, are you ready to do the job of today? And ideally, if somebody skims your first page, they see all of the things that you've done to showcase why you are ready for your chosen track, be it ML engineering or data engineering. And so you want to be able to showcase as uh, between your education, your personal projects, your 10 Academy projects, um, all the different things that are part of your, um, all the different reasons why you're ready for the job of today. Does that answer the question? Yes. Um, is there a hard and fast rule to how many lines there should be? I mean, a paragraph to me is, um, I would say, not more than three or four lines. So you want it to be, again, you want it to be skimmable. So somebody, when I skim a CV, um, often I wouldn't spend more than 30 seconds. So you're looking for certain keywords and you want to get a sense of, is this person in the right, um, is this person worth a deeper look? And so I think that three to four lines is probably enough. Definitely do not mention things like, you know, it's Rossmann Pharmaceuticals or it's Smart Ad A-B testing, it's completely irrelevant. Um, showing that you've uh, distilled it down to its essential parts is, is the most important thing. Okay, thank yeah. you. But it, it's just a rule of, it's just a estimate, right? Just like CVs, there's no hard and fast rule beyond, I don't think it should be more than two pages. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no problem, not now? Okay, uh, so my question is like, on the projects like we have done in groups and everything, so we have our section and everything, so how should we showcase that on the project? Like, uh, how should we approach it? So I think that's a good question. I think it's just like when you, when you are working, you won't be doing every part of the job yourself. But I think it's good to say, so imagine um, let's take let's take 10 Academy as an approach. Um, so if I'm describing what we do, then I'm pr I'm happy to say this is what 10 Academy is doing, and I'm part of the team that's doing it, and I can explain I should be able to explain everything that the team did, but I should also say that I'm not the one who's designing the technical challenges. So I can explain what my role is and what other people on the team what their role is, but um, I think the same approach there is fine. So as a test, you should be able to explain uh, for these 10 Academy projects what exactly what was done and what everyone's role was or what your role was. But you should understand, even if you didn't do the work yourself, you should understand um, how, how it worked. I think that's important. So as an example, it's fine to say this is 
I, you should say that I was a member of a group and this is what our group did. And we went from, uh, we set up this following uh, front end web system and we designed a uh, Kafka service, which was triggered by Airflow and that stored data in this database and give people an overview. And you can say my specific contribution was helping out in areas one, two, and three. And my colleagues were actually coding uh, five, six, and seven. And if they ask a question about how five, six, and seven were done, you should ideally be able to explain, if not every line of code, you should be able to explain the approach. OK, thank you. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. OK. So for everyone who's just joined, we're doing this pure Q&A. So um, yeah, just raise your hands, type your questions. Should I ask you guys questions? No? <laughs> I mean, you, you guys have come for the, you, <laughs> you guys have come here for the Q&A without Q, so you're just waiting for the A. That's also a, a strategy. Um, okay, let me ask you guys a question. How, for those of you, how many of you um, don't feel super comfortable in English? So maybe just put up your hand. Okay, great. Everyone here is comfortable in English. I thought there might might be some people who are not super comfortable um, and maybe looking for ways to practice their their professional English. I mean, is that really the case, guys? No, everyone is super comfortable in English. I'm a bit sur not now. Go ahead. Okay, I think the question is not clear for me. Like, is there another English besides this, or what no? Kind of no, no, Our, it, there's only one English, but the level of comfort with English. Yeah, okay, personally, I think I can communicate fairly easily and I can express my ideas and also understand. Uh, if there are other fields I should improve, uh, maybe I haven't, uh, I didn't know about that. But are you comfortable if I, do you worry about your ability to have a interview in English or written communication or other sorts of discussions? Do you worry about that? No, I don't. Okay. Is there anyone here who's worried about that? No. Okay. I don't want to pull. <laughs> I don't want to pull pick on people. Um, so I'm not going to. What other questions can I ask you guys? Um, So what I would like, I, I thought that we would have some questions about, and this is somehow uh, a link with the T-shaped learners. I thought we would have more questions about um, where do these, where are we going from here? Um, are we, what do we do if we don't know all aspects of the, the pipeline or how do we explain the gaps that we have? Um, where can we pick up missing pieces of knowledge? For example, SQL. I thought we would have more discussions in those in those veins. What does the process look like? What should I do if I don't have a job? How do I keep my profile updated? How do I rely on the alumni? So there's, there's a lot of different things to that we could be thinking about. Um, should I go for a master's or a PhD? Same. Sorry to go again. Uh, hopefully, I'm not taking anybody else's chances. It's, um, it's, always, it's always the same person. My question is about huh? I'm just making a pun that it's always the same person. Oh. <laughs> um. My LinkedIn profile is not really up to date or 
that fleshed out. I don't even think I have a picture on there or any posts or even try forming connections. How much should I focus on building back up to at least some good standard? How much is it important for the future? So I, would, I wouldn't worry about it right now. Um, I think, so the format that we're providing, you may or may not want to use it going forward. But I think LinkedIn will be part of everyone's future um, because it is somehow the standard or it's becoming the standard, if not a standard. Um, I wouldn't worry about it for now because I think the format is not super ideal uh, for what we're, what we're trying to do because we did look at it, but it's, um, it is pretty, <clears throat> how would you say it? It is kind of strict in the way it's formatted. Um, so short answer, I wouldn't worry about it. But medium term answer is as soon as you're into work, I would I would probably default to um, um, I would probably default to CV plus LinkedIn plus GitHub. But you don't need to worry about that right now. So for now, work on this. You don't need to worry about your LinkedIn. And after that, I would default to CV plus uh, LinkedIn plus your GitHub. Kate? Um, I wanted to ask about the that period between us finishing the academy and getting a job. It's pretty uncertain how fast you will get a job. So do you, um, what do you recommend during that period? Like, should someone start freelancing? Should someone do short courses? Should someone, like, what other things in that period? Um, it depends on what your goal is, right? If So freelancing is not a bad way to make a little bit of money, but, um, so I've, I think I've used this analogy before, and I would use it again. Freelancing, it's like, it's like a relationship. And a, a full-time job is like getting married. Um, freelancing is like Tinder. I don't know if you guys use Tinder in your countries. But um, it depends on what you're looking for. If you want stability where you invest and the other person invests and you build something, then that's more of a full-time job. And it takes, it's harder to find a long-term partner than it may be to find a weekend partner. So. I, my suggestion would be that you um, gap, you try and plug the gaps that you have in your CV as much as you can and uh, work towards a full-time job. Because I think uh, for each and every one here, you were able to get a full-time job. And I would, we had a, a pretty negative experience with trying to get onto freelance platforms, um, get people onto freelance platforms last year. We thought we would try it. We actually were completely wrong. We thought that it would be a good way ahead and that people would be able to, um, to do useful work. And one of, there's two reasons we were wrong, actually more than two reasons. One is that um, it's very, very, very hard to get started because if you have no track record, then people don't uh, give you a chance. And the second, and this is probably, well, the second is there's a lot of time wasters on platforms like Upwork. And so it's difficult to do a good job if you um, if your employer doesn't has never defined what a good job is. So we had somebody who got put into a position where they had sort of a number on their head. I think the person said, look, I'll give you $500 to do this short task. Sounds great, right? So the person starts doing it. And then the person kept adding on more and more and more and more work and said, if you don't do this, then I'm not going to pay you or I'll give you a bad review. So I mean, that's not always the case, but they also exist. And the third is, I don't think you'll necessarily learn as much at the level that you're at um, doing freelancing. Because the types of works that, type of work that you will be able to do, it's more likely, I mean, I'm not saying, I can't say that it's 100%, but I would say you're more likely to learn uh, in full-time work. Now, what does this mean? So what should you actually do? Um, I, would, I would look, spend a lot of time looking at 
what industry is looking for. We will continue to provide job opportunities. We will continue to try and match you. We will put together a alumni platform. Uh, Yatiana is working on that. It won't be uh, Rocket Chat, but we'll put together an alumni platform to allow us to stay in touch. And I would, uh, yeah, I think one has to be ready for uh, three to six months of full-time work to get a full-time job. For some people, it might go very quickly. For some people, it might be less time than that. But I would focus that time and energy on um, learning more and more about exactly what industry is looking for and uh, skill plugging the gaps that you might have. But I, I'm happy to talk about it, Kate. I'd like to know more about more about what you think or what anyone else thinks. So what do you guys think about freelance? Am I painting too negative of a picture? So we can unmute, we can have a discussion. It doesn't have to be so one directional Q&A. If somebody else has a different perspective, they should also respond to Kate. Um, I, w I was only asking, personally, I've never tried freelancing, but I've seen it in Kenya with a lot of data scientists and people in the machine learning field. They always have something related to freelancing. I don't know if it's on the side. So that's why I was a bit curious about it. Yeah. So what we've seen is that it's very hard to get started. Once you do get started, you can do well. But um, I don't know. I think it is, uh, I still, it, I think it's maybe more of a philosophical approach. It's a little bit like relationships. Do you want to build for the longer term? And I would say long term is you should plan to do, be at your first job for at least one year. Or are you more interested in probably short term work, earning a little bit more money per job? But um, yeah, it's also different. You can do many projects in parallel, but you're also at the mercy of many different clients. And that's not always uh, easy. So I would, I, I would, I mean, you guys are free, right? That's the approach that we've set up. You've come for training, we've signed a contract. So once you're working, then there's the pay, uh, the pay it forward model, but we don't own your time. We're only here to make recommendations. And uh, having tried this out, um, I would recommend that you, uh, put the effort into a full-time job. Um, another question. Uh, okay, from the alumni of the Ken Academy program, what trends have you noticed to them after they get jobs? Like, do they end up doing a master's? What's what's the trend up the there? <laughs> Is it relevant? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would ask everyone why they want to do the master's. Um, what what part of the master's is really of interest to them? What's, what's the goal? So I wouldn't blindly, I think sometimes doing graduate work can also be like a job or it's a place to be, or you can tell your grandmother that I'm doing my master's or PhD and everyone, it's kind of well understood. Um, so I think that that part is, uh, yeah, I think that that part is there. Um, what are the trends? So I can, if for batch three, it's probably early to say. We recommended most people um, stay for at least a year, and we only started getting people placed three months out. So it took us, it took us a little bit of time to figure out what industry was looking for, and that's we've integrated a lot of those lessons into batch four. So batch three training is uh, was different. Um, it was a little bit less industry focused. So people are getting to the nine month time frame. Some people are in the probation period. Some people's uh, jobs didn't, uh, they didn't work out. So people got six months of work and then the company changed priorities or for whatever reason they weren't continued or their contracts weren't renewed. So there's a whole, and then other people have been promoted. Some people are doing really well. Some companies are coming back and saying, we want more. So there's no, um, well, I, I'd say the one trend is the people who demonstrated, and I always say the same three things, or maybe four things. There's work ethic, there's uh, self-teaching, there's curiosity, and there's the ability to help uh, others in your community. Those same skills, the people who exhibited those best in as part of the training, they've also, I would say, uh, have done have done best in terms of their work. 
I mean, people don't necessarily change. You can pick up new habits and you can expose people, but um, the same people who are who weren't able to get it done in stage in the training phase, th those trends by and large uh, they continued. But most people are doing really well. I mean, we're we're here because we also have really strong profiles from employers. Trainees are happy. Um, so the question of do you want to do a master's or not, it's up to you. But I would really think about why do you want to do a master's. Um, I'll share a, so I had a discussion with somebody, we've been talking to different people from industry to try and learn a little bit more about what they're looking for. And he, I think I've, I might have told you about this guy, he worked, uh, he's head of a machine learning team at Paystack slash uh, Stripe worked at uh, Facebook before, worked at Google, I think he worked at Microsoft too. And he, I was, I was talking to him about uh, coding versus math. And he was saying that in his opinion, the mathematical background is only relevant for a, sm a small subset of people. Um, and that's his experience at these enormous companies. So at a smaller company, um, there's the example that Brenda gave. She did her PhD in physics. Um, has a very very strong math background. Math background, I think, in many ways similar to similar to Yebabel's background. Um, is that the best use of their time, as opposed to really developing another craft or another skill? So I think that's a that's a decision that you need to make, and this is where I would encourage everyone to think about their life priorities. And if you if you want to stay employed then getting a master's may not be the most time effective way to gain those skills. So I, I would just think about that. And yeah, each person will have to come up with their own answer. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Azari, I see your question. Um, well, I, do, I don't know. It's hard to say. It depends on how much time or energy you put into it. Um, I don't see that as something negative. The one, I mean, so maybe I can add one thing to what Kate was saying and also, or Kate's question and Azaria's question. One common thing that I've heard from many, 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 many people is that they like seeing contributions to open source projects as an example of people who are doing really well, of people that they want to hire. So if you make some contribution to a well-known or to an open source project and you can showcase that as part of your GitHub or your CV or your, your profile, then that is, uh, that's appreciated. And so that's something that if anyone wants to do something, then try and get involved in uh, an open source project. I've heard that from at least four people in completely, complete four independent, completely independent people in obviously in the same industry but working at different levels of the industry. So Azaria, I don't know. It depends if, I don't think it'll hurt you. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see that hurting you. But I think being, an, being a part-time entrepreneur is, um, I don't know if being a part-time, to what extent being a part-time entrepreneur is possible. Yeah. So who's next? Steshi? Stella? Uh, okay. I want to ask uh, three questions in one. Uh, the first one, I'm scared to ask, but let me just ask. So I, was, uh, I want to ask about English just because some people will be in those positions where they'll be hiring in the near future. I'm just wondering if, if a typo should be a a good reason to actually not speak to someone if uh, if their profile is good and just a typo would make someone not uh, have an interview. And uh, uh, I also wanted to ask, yeah, what happens if you don't get a job after after ten academy? And then uh, so. In this That's alumni... two. What's, what's your yeah. third question? Okay, yeah. So in the, in the alumni network, I was just wondering if it's something like Rocket Chat. So if I want to talk to Arun, if uh, I can just go and type a message and reach out to Arun, or how do we keep in touch? So you always have my email. I'll take the last one first. Um, you always have my email, so you can always send an email and reach out to me. 
Um, we're currently, and Yetiana is working on this. If any of you are interested in helping to develop this, or I mean, develop it is too strong. We're trying to figure out whether Discord or Telegram, um, so that it'll be one of it'll be a similar chat platform. It'll be a similar chat platform. It'll be a similar chat platform to that. Um, right now, we're using Slack. Slack has disappearing messages, so we will use Discord or Telegram. And the whole point is that we can. Stay in touch. Sorry, just give me one, one second. Sorry. Um, so that's, yeah, I, I would like us to stay in regular contact, but even more than that, I would like each of you to stay in regular contact. Um, because I, I think that you will benefit a lot from, could be sharing job offers, could be asking questions about how do you approach A, B, or C. Um, we want to be able to share training, job offers, and I recognize, having been a student as well, that it's one tends to stay in touch with the same five or six people. But um, yeah, so that's that's what the alumni platform will look like. Your first question, um, so let me ask you a question, uh, Stella. If you were hiring somebody and they came to the interview with a food stain on their, sh on their shirt, what would you say? Uh, I think that's not a first good impression. So I, that's what I would say as a typo as well, right? So you would, in the back of my head and your head, you would think, well, didn't they look at themselves before they came? And of course, it makes no difference on their ability to deliver anything. But it's it just shows that there's an attention to detail which is missing. So small typos, um, there is no book that is perfect. There is no CV that is perfect. But if it's a very obvious typo, then it really shouldn't be there. And this is where you have, you should be asking your peers to proofread your stuff and you might miss something very obvious. So I wouldn't worry too much about getting it exactly small details perfect, but um, there shouldn't be any obvious typos. And to your third, your second question, what happens if you don't get a job? Um, so tell me more about that question. What, what, are the what are the possible answers to that question? Uh, it should, should they just uh, keep hoping that uh, someday uh, a job will pop up? From or, where? Uh, from where? <laughs> from uh, from uh, you guys. Mm -hmm. That's one option. What other options are there? Should I just go back to school and uh, make a good use of my time? Okay, that's another option. Uh, should I venture into another career? That's a third option. Uh, I'm out of options. You're out of options. Can anyone help Stella with some options? So either we find her a job, she uh, goes back to school, or she changes careers. Any other options? Startup, okay, that's a fourth option, Smench. Is, is there not one really big option that's that's being missed? Apply for a, a job by yourself. As a Whitlam, yeah. So um, I'm also thinking about Stella, but the thing is that what I understand is um, from time to time, when you get a, when you don't get a job from interviews and everything, like there is something that you missed, and probably you're gonna you're gonna like um, uh, approve uh, like improve your things like that. Uh, for example, if you if you miss on one interview and you didn't get a job, on that interview you will learn something, and then improve your skills what you have like you haven't worked on and what the company needed. Then like improve through times. So I I I'm I'm thinking to do that. 
within time if this is the career um I'm looking forward to work on within time I'm gonna improve through skills and somehow I will get the job yes. okay <clears throat> thanks uh, Ms. Whitlam. I think that's an important point that you have to keep working on even if you go to an interview and you don't you're not successful um, that you can keep working but Azaria and Deborah have made a suggestion um, which you hadn't mentioned, Steshi, which is to apply for a job by yourself. What do you think about that suggestion? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's that's one of the options. But uh, if like both sides are not working, I'm sorry. If both sides are not working, if you're looking for a job, you're not getting it. Uh, neither is. Uh, is there any job coming from the side of Ten Academy? Okay, but I, I, this should be uh, number one, right? Everyone should be actively looking for work. So as much work as as we, I do, we do, the team does. Fifty people looking for work will always be more effective than one person looking for work. So each of you should be looking for work. We will help, and we will try and put everyone into contact with different employers but everyone should be looking for a job by him or herself. That's that's number one. What happens if you don't find a job by yourself? I would be ready. And so we exist because we think that within, within six months of looking, anyone here who is motivated will be able to get a good job, either as a data engineer or as a machine learning engineer or in an adjacent field. Maybe it's called something else wherever you go. But that's that's our whole premise. So we 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 believe that's possible. Otherwise, our whole model is broken. Does that make sense, Steshi? Okay. Yeah, it does. It does. So let me ask a question to everyone here. How long should people? What happens if you accept an offer and two weeks later you get a better offer? What should you do? It's not really a question about profiles, but nevertheless. Yeah. Uh, who was first? Um, Zelda? Zelda? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I think you should continue with the work in hand because uh, two weeks is a very short time. So by that time, you have already signed a contract. And it's about uh, trust. Yeah, so I think you should continue because even before leaving, I think there is some time. Yes, you should give a notice ahead of some time if you are uh, going to leave. So even if you leave, I think uh, during this notice time, you, you might also miss that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, it may depend on the, uh, your situation, but to make it generalizing, I think maybe stay on the work in hand. Mm -hmm. Elias? OK, thanks. Like, I have similar experience. Like, I've started working at a company, and like within a month or something, I got another offer. But like, if you have some interest in the project you are working on, I think it's better to stay a little bit longer and to with other people and other stuff can also take time. So for a little bit of increase in salary or something, changing companies, I don't think is a good idea. Does anyone have a, a contrarian viewpoint? Does anyone disagree? Or does anyone have a question about this? Yeah, same. When it comes to offers, as long as it depends on maybe the nature of the relationship, 
if obviously if the offer the first offer came through at least okay for this scenario let's say it came through 10 academy and the second offer came it's just through your own search for the first one the gating on the contract is not to you but to other people so it's too high and since you've made a commitment to both organizations it's better to stay but at some point you will be faced with a situation where there are just two companies and at the end of the day they're trying to extract the most from you and you're trying to extract the most value from them and if the cost of just terminating your contract and just joining the sec the taking the second offer is minimal you're supposed to do what's best for you there is no commitment that you have to an entity that does at the end of the day not entirely care about you as a person growing it or whatever mm. i think that mm. covers <laughs> okay anyone else kate um i'm thinking that if that said company found someone who um, could enable them to cut costs. Maybe someone who could do your job at a cheaper cost. They wouldn't hesitate to let you go. So I think I'd take the other job. And that reason. Okay. I don't know how should we go about it. <laughs> Anyone else? Does the Whitlam? So my perspective. Uh... I'm thinking that situations will matter, but I, I would take the job if uh, what I'm looking on the company, like my future career being developed and my skill is uh, being, uh, like I can do more on the company, but always um, it depends also with the, uh, the contract and like the environment you are in the, with the current work too. So like, you have to compare everything, then maybe decide. Uh, like, not uh, I will. I will not decide to the money, because because like the money will be will be here after the experience and then everything, even if you stayed with with the company. But the more importantly, like developing your skills or like working on the project that you see your future developed on the, your career, that will probably affect my decision. Okay, anyone else? So, yeah, Michael, Michael Tickler. Uh, yes, uh, I think it depends. Uh, it depends on, uh, on how much job security they both give. So if one of them gives a very good job security, I'll go with that. Anyone else want to go before I give you my perspective? Elias? Okay. On the earlier point, same raised, like the benefit of working at specific companies, not just actually the salaries I pay, but also like the work experience. For example, if you want to have an experience in web development and the company is working in web development, I think staying as a company may be beneficial, not just by the salary, but the experience you are going to gain. And that doesn't mean like you should stay as a company and work for low salary for years, but like at least for six months, if you had already sent an agreement, I think you should. Yeah, no, I think that summarizes very nicely what I would recommend to everyone here. I think everyone for their first job should be ready to stay at that job for one year, but in all cases for at least six months. So I think it's for most people, it's their first, uh, it's their first real full-time job. And there's a lot that you will learn by following a project through an entire life cycle, um, getting to know the company culture, you will work with different people. Um, and I would strongly recommend that everyone stays at their first job for at least one year. 
Now, it is a little bit, it may seem like a risk because you are taking yourself off the market for one year. But this is where the relationship analogy, I think, goes a little bit deeper. When you start a relationship with somebody, of course, nobody is dead and you don't start, you don't stop looking, not that you look around, but you see other people as well. And you might meet somebody and you say, how oh, this person is interesting. But the mindset of, I believe that I am better off in the long term in where I am now is an important one to develop. And I think in the long term, because this is not just a job, but you're trying to build a career in a, in a complicated field, um, not only will you learn more skills, and even if it's not exactly the right technical skills, but project management, people management, strategic planning, um, budgeting, different skills that you may pick up or you might get a sense of, um, and you may only get those skills once you develop a trust relationship with different people. So my strong recommendation would be that um, you stay for one year and at the very, very minimum for six months. Um, to Sam's point, and I think Elias made the same point, uh, before we place anyone into a work through us, or if it's a quote unquote friend of ours or a contact of ours, we will ask explicitly to make sure that we're on the same page, that the expectations are clear on both sides. So that, um, you know, you don't have to say yes. Nobody has to ever say yes to any job. But once you do say yes, then there is a um, spoken or unspoken obligation. Because it's true that somebody had mentioned that the company wouldn't hesitate to fire you and get rid of somebody, just hire the next cheaper person. But actually, I think that's a very pessimistic and not, not the correct viewpoint. It costs a company a lot of time and energy and support to get somebody onboarded. And it's very detrimental to a company to hire somebody and have them leave very quickly. And so, um, and it's not that companies are always looking. I think most, uh, most organizations are, unless you really stop producing value, there is some expectation that you also um, keep going because at the end companies, organizations are also made up of human beings. It isn't this um, pure optimization function. So I would say, think about your first job and be ready to stick it out for one year. And I wouldn't worry too, too much if it feels like there are times in the middle, like maybe you're not using your time in the best possible way, because that'll always happen, even at the best places, at the best jobs. Um, that's, always, that's always possible. Stella? Uh, okay, so how about uh, working multiple jobs? Uh, what's your advice on that? Same as having multiple relationships. Okay. How are you? How how do you plan to manage that? The multiple uh, job, the multiple jobs. I don't want to know about relationships, but tell me about multiple jobs. How do you plan to do? How would you do that? I know. I'm just asking because yeah, I've seen I've seen some alumni with the multiple jobs, and yeah, I just wanted to know. I mean, they really shouldn't. Um, I I would be surprised if they so may, maybe there's different different ways to look at it. So if you are um, if you're doing your regular full time job and you're doing it, but on weekends you're helping somebody out with starting a little startup or doing some web development a little bit on the side and it's a, a simple project that I think is not having a multiple job. That's having one job and you do a little bit of side work. I think that's uh, more okay than actually having multiple full-time jobs. I mean, that's just, I just don't see how you would do it. So I would, I would recommend that every, each of you has one full-time job and that is your main job. If you want to do some side work or volunteer or help someone learn to code or do ABC, that's, I think that's fine. That's actually not a bad thing, but I would not, uh, for example, I wouldn't get into freelancing on Upwork in parallel to your real job. Because I think that's, you're maximizing your short term, um, you're maximizing for the short term. And in the two year time frame, if you are the person who's at a good company and who's jumping in, who's learning, who's hungry, who's able to do lots of good things, I think you will progress much faster in terms of learning, in terms of salary, in terms of responsibility, than you will uh, freelancing. 
But maybe, I don't know, what do you guys think? Are there any dissenting viewpoints? Does anyone disagree? Somebody have their hand up, I don't see it. Anyone disagree with that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I would, if anyone asked me about that, it's, uh, I would stay far, far, far away from that. I would say, if you're taking a job which is poorly paid, which means you need to have two full-time jobs, then you're, you've said yes to the wrong job. I mean, just to go back to the relationship analogy, if your relationship is so bad that you need to have a second relationship to fix what's missing in the first one, then you're in a bad relationship. I mean, aside from, I think there's some people who have multiple husbands or wives, culturally speaking, leaving, leaving all of that aside. Um, okay, other questions? So I would stay, Bezawitalem, I would stay away from using templates. So there's two recommended uh, CV formats that we like, which are in these self-learning resources. It's linked in the careers manual. I would, I have my standard word format that I developed. I mean, it's not, I haven't developed it. It's just whatever template I use. Um, and I just keep updating that. So I wouldn't use one of these um, online templates. I think they're not that flexible. And then they always put their logo at the bottom and it's it's probably easier and faster to get started, but then it's not as flexible in the long term and you end up wasting a lot of space. Um, and some of the, I mean, there's some nice things that you see in some CVs which you can borrow, but I would recreate them myself. Um, I wanna make one point, I've seen a lot of, and maybe it's, it seems to be people from one uh, university who have these graphs that say, what is my level of knowledge in this field? So what is my Python knowledge? Is it five stars, four stars, or is it it's kind of 80%, 60%? I would stay away from that because what does what is 100% even mean? Um, does that mean you're the world's greatest Python programmer or that you are job ready? That if the 100% is not well defined, um, I would rather just put the name of the uh, software that you're able to use there, um, which is, I think that's sufficient for, for the jobs that we're finding or that we're applying for. So I would, there's a little if I were you, and this is the same as I do for myself, I just use Microsoft Word. If you want to use Google Docs or whatever, whatever other format you want to use, I would just create something there. Again, it should just be clean and simple and say, this is what I've done uh, in the past, which shows this is what I'm, this is why I'm qualified for the job that I'm applying for. I want to make one uh, suggestion on CVs as well. Um, I think too few of you are showcasing relevant courses that you took in university because there are some courses that I think are useful. For example, your statistics courses or algorithms courses or other software engineering courses. I think those are really useful and important. And I would, uh, I would make sure that you include those there because uh, that's, yeah, you've already done the course, so why not show that off? Any last questions? How's our optimism doing, guys? Are we rather optimistic about, um, like this, everyone entered this process uh, with the same goal, I believe, to get a good full-time job in industry um, in one of these fields. How, how are we feeling about that process? Can somebody tell me Somebody pessimistic, let me know why they're pessimistic. 
or nervous, and then I'd like to hear from somebody optimistic. So who's not, who's pessimistic? Who thinks this is going to be really difficult or is nervous and says, oh, I don't know exactly how I'm doing what I'm doing. No, no, nobody nervous, nobody pessimistic. Not now. Okay. Okay. Sorry for being the pessimist. Yeah, please. Okay. So, uh, in my opinion, I'm a, I'm a bit scared on the interviews and everything, even though uh, you and everybody advise us to be optimist, uh, to showcase our work, not to be scared and to trust you and everything. It's nice, but deep down there are some feelings like uh, sometimes, for me personally, uh, I got a problem like I compare myself with the other trainees and everything so uh, most of them are highly skilled and they do perform well so if you see that like sometimes I feel like I got no chance of getting a job so that's my feeling I have but sometimes I become optimist it's like an emotional thing sometimes you feel good sometimes I feel bad mm -hmm. so, so, that's so I I think one thing that I'd like to say is I don't want irrational optimism, right? We're not, we're not asking you to um, be optimistic with no reason. I think that what we're saying is do the work and here's the work that you need to do. Um, we're available to support. You should practice. We'll give you guidance on how to practice. Um, and then it is, uh, yeah, I think the point that you make is to be a little bit nervous and frankly speaking, of course, everyone's nervous before they go for a job interview because if you, especially if you really want it, there are these unknowns that you have to control. Um, but I would say when it comes to, so I, I don't know if you were there in the, the talk with from Phil Clay. Were you there, not now? No, I was not. So he, um, so you, I, you can look him up if you don't know who he is. He's, he was the head of a big institution. And he was saying that he realized as he went through life, there are many, many, many more opportunities um, than there are uh, people to take up those opportunities. So it's actually not a, it's, there's no scarcity of jobs. There's no scarcity of opportunities. You guys are only 50 people. And so it's not that you're going to be competing against um, every other person here. Actually, there's enough work for everyone to do. So I would encourage you to drop the competition mindset and just say, look, all of us are here, all of us are ready, and each of us will go out and make our own way into the world. Um, the competition won't help anyone. I think that in the first instance, of course, we have people last year, somebody is earning seven times what somebody else is earning in the first job, but these things balance out very quickly. And if you take this long-term mindset and believe that there are enough jobs um, and have patience, so maybe it's not only about confidence, but a lot of it is, is, a lot of it is about patience, I believe, then um, I hope you will believe that by putting the work in, trusting the system, being patient, and continuing to do the work, that things will work out. So that's the... Um, but this, the, the feeling of... I don't know if it's feeling in competition or feeling like other people know more things than you do. Unfortunately or fortunately, there will always be people like that, no matter where you go. And the better you do, then others will, you'll go swim in bigger and bigger ponds and there'll always be someone else who knows something that you don't know. But I think there'll be things that you know that the other person doesn't know as well. Um, Toyin says, She's not good enough to get a good, great job yet. So then Toyin, I think there's, I would break it down piece by piece. What are you missing? Um, so when you say you're not good enough, let's get, let's get very, very specific. What, are, what skill are you missing? What approach are you not comfortable with? What do you need to practice? Um, and I, our job is to give you that framework. Let's go from, I don't know how to get a job to I'm not good enough to get a job to I need to get to this level in these three skills and then I'm ready for a job. 
And so, Toyin, that's our goal. Um, well, Beza Whitlam, I would say that actually, um, yeah, I mean, there, I think you just, same thing, make a list, figure out what it is that you don't know. And then I think I would talk to your colleagues um, and figure out who's willing to help. And maybe there's something you know that the other person doesn't know. And so, yeah, I, th I would, ex I would, find a way. I think that nervousness will only go away once it actually works out, but um, nobody knows everything. I think it's more important than knowing everything. And I was, I've used the analogy this morning on some of the one-on-ones I had, where just like a kidney doctor doesn't know everything about all the other parts of the body, but they have to know that the heart is there and what does the heart do, even if they don't know all of the ins and outs of uh, heart disease and heart function and heart surgery but they need to at least know the heart is there, the brain is there, the bones are there, the muscles are there, nervous system, all the different pieces are there and how do they fit together? And then the details, well, it's just not uh, as super important. And Toyin, I would say then you have to get to, I, I mean, I can't, I don't, we, we, I don't know what else. So Toyin, can you unmute? What would you like us to do? What do you suggest? How, how can we help you? Toyin, are you there? Okay, maybe she's not able to speak, I'm not sure. I would, I would like to know what you would like us to do because I'm not exactly sure. Okay, that's, <laughs> I guess her connection dropped. Uh, somebody optimistic to round us off? Who's feeling optimistic that they're on track? Okay, same. So same as so Smench. Okay, good. Smench, let's hear from you. I'm sure I'm not saying your name correctly, but Smench, are you able to speak? Okay, so Smench is also not able to speak. So Zelalem? So Smench, maybe you can type. But Zelalem, love to hear from you. And then from Same, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, thank you. So uh, from yesterday's discussion and today's session too, I'm feeling uh, optimistic because most of our questions are being answered. So uh, how much time you expect for a motivated person to get a job? So what did you do during meanwhile? And also the other thing is, uh, I was also thinking meanwhile, trying the freelancing uh, sites. And uh, as you said, uh, the biggest thing is like uh, getting the first, uh, you know, few uh, reviews, uh, great reviews, and you spend a lot of time. So uh, rather than doing that, maybe getting better of the skills what the industry needs. So, and you telling us that you are very confident that we are uh, job ready so the, i think uh, hearing this i'm uh, feeling very confident so after the training gets in this i'm i'll try to upgrade my skills and gain some new ones mm. needed in the industry so if we keep upgrading there will be a good amount of uh, nice interviews. Mm. Great. Thanks. Same? Um, how I saw it is initially I would 
have said pessimistic, but when I thought about my experiences so far, at least in the world of work, all of the jobs I've done so far, when I started out, the amount of knowledge I had and the experience I had, very limited, but somehow at the end of it, I made it work. So there should be no reason why this can't be the same. And of course, the interview process might be more difficult because it's a slightly more technically complex field, but opportunities exist eventually. One of there will be a place for me in the world, in the world of work. And of course the road might not be easy. And so that's why I say cautious, cautiously optimistic, but eventually I'll get there. And yeah, I guess that's, that's how I see it. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's, I think both of, I think the questions here show a maturity, which is, uh, which is relevant. And I think the caution, nervousness, optimism, cautious optimism, they're all parts of the right spectrum. So I would just encourage each of you to keep, um, let's, let's change the job search mindset from hopes and dreams into conscious action. And I hope with the, con the, the framework that we've provided and the ability to ask questions, we don't want people just to hope and dream but to say, to know that I have to do the following six things and I can increase my li likelihood of getting an interview from, I don't know, 1% to 10% and increase my likelihood of getting um, through the interview from 5% to 50%. And if we do that, then actually I think this is where the system that we're trying to build really starts to work because then the number of people who get placed into jobs um, works, uh, starts to actually become a meaningful number. So hopes and dreams is what we're trying to get away from. Take these steps, improve your chances. We can never make it a hundred percent, but we want to make it into, um, a non close to zero percentage. And so Smench is saying, I learned from the training experience I had, I think in a given time I'll do what the company wants. And I'm always interested to know new things even though I'm not good enough in the technical part. So I think, Samantha, you should get good enough in the technical part. Maybe that's instead of saying you're not good enough, um, what is it that you need to learn to become good enough? So I would just encourage you to do that. So I'm going to stop recording and take a five-minute break, and then we'll be back for the T-shaped learners uh, Q&A. All right. Thanks, everyone.